Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Buckeye Weekly Podcast. I am Tony Gerdeman here, as always, with Tom Orr. Tom, how's it going? Tony, I, every week when we do these Michigan shows, I'm like, I feel like next week we're going to learn a lot more about the Michigan football team. And then the next week comes and goes, and I'm like, well, I think they're good, but I'm not totally sure yet. And I like we were just we just did like half of a show talking before we hit record. And it's like, yeah, I don't know when we're actually going to know just how good this team is. And a lot of that for me is based on how good this Michigan defense is. I think the scheme is working well. Things are coming into place, but they're not being tested you've got a wisconsin offense that has been bad all season graham mertz the one game he's starting to play well daxton hill comes in and knocks him out of the game and so they go to chase wolf and he gets two turnovers pretty quickly a couple of back-to-back turnovers all in all it's a it's a 38 17 win for michigan in a game that i didn't get to see live but every time i looked at the score it seemed like they were dominating i didn't know they went to into half 13 10 Mm-hmm. With Wisconsin driving down the field with three plays, 63 yards in like 18 seconds or something to score. And, you know, they get the ball with 22 seconds left and they hit two big passes and boom, you know, they've got a touchdown and it looks like it's a real game. But of course, you know, then Michigan just continues to, I, don't, I can't even say do what they do because they didn't do what they do. <laughs> they, they threw the ball. They did some stuff that we've been saying they need to do. And that's, Get the ball downfield, throw some jump balls, let your big receivers go and make some plays. Now, I don't think Cade McNamara should have been throwing it into double coverage like he did it at one point, but overall, it's it's 38-17 at Wisconsin. That's impressive. How they got there, though, I don't it's not as impressive as just the overall score and venue and the fact that it happened. You you look at it and you try to well, these parts don't actually go together. How did this happen? Well, this is two weeks in a row that that's been the case for a Wisconsin game. And it was the same thing with with uh, Notre Dame the week before where it's, what, 13-10 Wisconsin early in the fourth quarter, and all of a sudden it ends up like 41-13. This was 10 nothing Michigan with a minute to go in the first half, and then there's 13 points scored in the span of one minute, like more points scored in the final minute of the first half than the previous 29. And then it looks like maybe Wisconsin's got something going and then Graham Mertz gets hurt and then Wisconsin had nothing going. This is, you know, you you go into every season with like, okay, I don't know very much about the Big Ten, but I can tell you absolutely Wisconsin's going to have a good offensive line. They're going to have a good running back. They're going to be effective offense. They're going to be able to good, solid defense. Like this is what Wisconsin is every year this ain't it like that. That is not this year's Wisconsin team. They're one in three for the first time since Barry Alvarez's first season in 1990. Like that is real, real bad. And I mean, we can, we can go through some of the stats later when we're talking about Wisconsin's running attack. It's like, I don't, I just, I don't know how much credit to give Michigan because it's like, normally you bottle up a Wisconsin running attack. It's like, wow, you've really done something. It's like, well, Notre Dame, Penn state, they did like the exact same thing. I just, this is this is a game where no Wisconsin player had more than had 20 yards rushing. Like I can't imagine that has ever happened before. And it's like, but I don't I don't know what that actually means this year. <laughs> just I think it might just mean Wisconsin's not very good. Well, from what we've seen this season, Wisconsin is not very good. And they're playing some okay teams that have looked below average against other teams. And it's it, let's just start with the Michigan offense. We can go from there and fill in all of the details. Cade McNamara, 17 of 28 for 197 yards, two touchdowns, a long of 38. I thought he was he was pretty good. He still makes some throws where you're like, a defense needs to take advantage of that throw. It needs to intercept that throw. Like I said, he did throw a jump ball into double coverage, but I was happy to see him throwing downfield, letting his receivers like Cornelius Johnson go up and get it. He caught two that were just, you know, throw it up and go get it. He got to Roman Wilson. I was surprised. I've said before that he's not one of those jump ball guys, but he went up and got one. And so that was good to see. So he is trusting his arm. He's trusting his receivers. The coaches are trusting him more. So that was uh, that that's a positive sign for an offense that didn't run the ball last week, 
Didn't run it very well this week. 112 yards on 44 carries, something like, I don't know, two and a half yards a carry, three yards a carry, something like that. Uh, I'm not great at math, but just struggled. They um, made good use of some fourth downs, but also got stuffed. They failed to convert a touchdown on, on uh, getting a, the ball on the five yard line, Wisconsin's five yard line after a punt hit a Wisconsin leg. And, you know, you're, you're sitting first and goal at the five had to settle for a field goal. So there's still some issues with the offense, but it's good to see the passing game stepping up. And he only, you know, came back to throws for 197 yards, but he only played like three quarters. What go ahead and talk about that. But also what do you think of the whole JJ McCarthy coming into the game randomly to hand the ball off at times? Yeah, I, I was going to ask you about that because I, I I feel like they like McNamara well enough, but they're also sort of designing things to take advantage of the fact that they know what he can and can't do well. You know, going for it on fourth down, like that's good. Like Jim Jim Harbaugh deserves a lot of credit for it. He went for it twice on fourth down on his side of the fifty on the first drive. Went worked the first time, didn't work the second time. They did it right before the first touch on the flea flicker. That was a you know, it was like a third and 15, and then it was a fourth and two. And then they, that was a pass to Roman Wilson. And then that set up the flea flicker to Cornelius Johnson on the next play. What I, I thought at halftime, like I should go back and track this. How many times on third down is Cade McNamara throwing the ball short of the sticks? Because it felt like it was like maybe once he threw a pass to sticks, but all the other times you're throwing it short of the sticks, which if you go into the game knowing if it's fourth and short, we're going to go for it then that's something that's not, you know, nearly as much of an unforgivable sin as it normally is. But it was just like a lot of check downs to Eric all and a lot of just kind of, you know, short passes or guys running routes three yards short of the sticks. And then you're setting up fourth and two. And if you've got Hassan Haskins and you've got a decent, decent offensive line, like that can be a viable strategy if you're not able to, you know, if you're able to blow the other team off the ball, like they were at times. But it also just to me reflects like, I think they know kind of what he can and can't do at this point and where his strengths and weaknesses lie. And they're just trying to give him kind of shorter, easier throws and then just sort of put the offense in a position to to convert later rather than trying to make him make a difficult throw downfield. I think they're setting up Ohio State for some play action. Just, you know, because they've had J.J. McCarthy coming in, handing the ball off or doing some some reads. Uh, Mm -hmm. Just It's the Ohio State wrinkle. Yeah, well, and McCarthy's an interesting one because it's like you you see him in enough different times that I don't know whether to read into that. They're trying to keep him healthy and keep him out of the transfer portal, Mm -hmm. or they really are viewing this as something they can, you know, take advantage of later. Because he had the, was it the long pass to Dalen Baldwin down the right sideline? Like, I mean, you've seen the arm. The arm, the arm talent is there. I think he's, you know, you look at him and Kyle McCord and you see some similarities where, you know, there's Sometimes there's good decisions and sometimes there's bad decisions, but they're true freshmen. So they're, you know, this is going to be a process for both of them. He does maybe bring some stuff that Cade McNamara doesn't. So you wonder if they're, you know, are they working him in for that? Or is this just a trying to keep him happy? You know, some of the Tate Martell packages that we saw in like 2018, like you're trying to keep this guy happy and around and, you know, in, in an era when guys are transferring constantly, sometimes after one year you kind of have to play that game as well. So I don't I don't know how much to read into that in terms of what it could mean for on-field this year versus what it could mean for just having him in the room long-term because he does look like there's there's going to be something there. I think there's something to be said for just getting on the field, even if you're just handing the ball off. The history of Jim Harbaugh's quarterbacks at Ohio at, at, at Michigan. <laughs> Almost spoke that one to existence. Says they need more than just one. So if they can can continue to work J.J. McCarthy and like who thought he would be throwing the ball at Wisconsin earlier in the season unless he was starting that game or Mm -hmm. McNamara got benched like that is how I see McCarthy playing in this game not because they're up 31 to 10 and hey let's you know let's just go have some fun or even when it was close let's just go hand hand the ball off I'm you're sending me in for two plays okay I guess but it's all good uh good experience and good usage that uh you know hope they hope doesn't pay dividends this year. Like you don't have to cash it in. You just hope Cade McNamara stays healthy and continues to play well. And we'll see uh, We, we where, where are the defenses that are going to really push this group? I mean, Wisconsin 
is a good defense and they held Michigan down in the running game and you know they threw for still threw for 253 yards but as you look in the schedule Penn State is the next staunch defense that is going to hold Michigan down but I mean Rutgers did it and let's not think like Rutgers is some outstanding defense although maybe they are good I mean I say they only scored 45 points on them in the first half but also called off the dogs in their final drive of that first half or else they would have had 52 but you know is it is it Nebraska the black shirt's going to do it you know with, with as I don't know I want to say simple as Michigan's offense is Michigan does what they do and sometimes they do it well Sometimes you're able to stop it because this is what they do. Can a Nebraska take advantage of that? Can the home crowd get going? Can it phase the quarterback where, oh, no, the running game has stopped. I need to make some plays. Does that come into play? So, you know, there's there's enough danger in the schedule, but not so much that I can't see Michigan running the table until they host Ohio State at this point. It's interesting because they have a decent schedule. They're playing decent teams. I think the, some of the you know some of the helmets on the schedule when we were looking at it over the summer, Washington has not been Washington this year. Wisconsin has not been Wisconsin this year. Nebraska is much more than they typically have been. I think Nebraska is a better team than they have been. Northwestern is garbage this year. Michigan State is way better than you expected this year. Indiana is not nearly as good as you expected this year. Penn State's pretty good. Maryland has its moments and then there's Ohio state. And part of our conversation before we started was this is a little bit of a styles makes fights year where I don't know, even the good teams on Michigan schedule. I don't know who before Ohio state really pushes them in a way that is going to challenge them or be a big problem for them. I mean, Penn state can't really run the ball. I mean, they're okay, but they just, their offensive line is not great. They're not running the ball consistently. Sean Clifford's been good, but not incredible. They've got a good defense. So, uh, you know, Penn State seems like rich man's Wisconsin, I guess, I, this year. I don't know. Michigan State can run the ball, but they're not, you know, they're not super talented. Michigan has better talent than Michigan State does, but that game's in it. in East Lansing. I think that's going to be an interesting one. But they could get all the way to the Ohio State game without playing a team that can both run the ball and pass the ball you know, effectively in a way that really threatens their defense and play, you know, you're going to, you're going to face some good def- defenses before then, but it just, it, this whole schedule looks like they could just score 31 points and win every game before the Ohio state game. And then you get to the Ohio state game and it's like 31 points is probably not going to cut it, but I don't, I don't know if they're going to know truly what they have on defense even then, because they, they're not going to have been pushed the way Ohio state can push them. I mean, who is the Travion Henderson on the schedule? Before they get to who is who is seventy five percent of Travion Henderson on the schedule before they get to Ohio State? There isn't. Who, who is? I mean, well, let's give Ken, what, Kenneth Walker. Yeah, at Michigan State I mean, has been really okay. good this year. So okay, so who is so who is seventy five percent of the Ohio State receiving core on this yeah. on the schedule? Maybe I mean maybe Jahan Dotson and you know the assorted other Penn State receivers like maybe. But they're still one dimensional. But they're point. still one dimensional. Pe- you know Maryland. I mean like eh. I mean. You you got individual pieces, but you don't have whole units. Mm-hmm. There are, you know, you're seeing Ohio State kind of come together. I mean, in, and, you know, in previous weeks, we've talked about the fact that, like, if Michigan was playing Ohio State, like Michigan in September, playing Ohio State in September would have had a pretty darn good chance to win. You're seeing things click for Ohio State and Michigan's getting better, but they're kind of like edging upwards. Ohio State seems like they're kind of going vertical right now. and. I there are some 2018 vibes that I'm getting right now. Like this is going to be Michigan's going to run the table, be feeling really good, and then you know, and and then you and then you level up from AAA to the major leagues, and then you maybe you know, then it's not so easy to hit the curveball. Michigan was number four in that 2018 game. Ohio State number ten. Uh, just as an idea, I I said coming into the Wisconsin game that Nebraska's offense poses a bigger threat to. Michigan's defense, just based on what Adrian Martinez, the the unknown of Adrian Martinez, mm-hmm. which is also a threat for Nebraska because of you know <laughs> because of the unknown of Adrian Martinez. Yes, a, exactly. He he can take and he can and give and well, I'm it's going to be a fun one to watch if we do indeed. Uh, we'll we'll eventually get to watch it. 
the, getting back to the Michigan offense, Blake Corum again uh, held under 100 yards. This time he was 15 for 46, which uh, is concerning. 3.1 yards per carry, and Hassan Haskins uh, 19 carries for 47 yards. You're starting. This is the second week in a row that they have way declined from their average. Not coincidentally, two Big Ten teams with, you know, I think Wisconsin has a very good defense. Rutgers has Mm -hmm. a solid defense that knows what they want to do. So it's concerning that Michigan wasn't able to run last week and and less concerning that they weren't able to run this week because we didn't, didn't expect them to. I would have expected them to do, I don't know, the, the long carry of the game was Hassan Haskins with the eight yarder. Blake Corum had a seven yarder. That's not acceptable. But then you look at the score again, and it's like, well, what's not acceptable about a 38, 38 17 win? Why don't you just shut up? And yes, Tom, I know I can hear you saying that. But, you know, at some point you're going to need both. And you, you can't just be one or the other every single time. And to see two Big Ten teams in a row just shut down the Michigan running game to this point. It's, it's a concern. Michigan's still leading the big 10 in rushing or leading, leading, yeah, leading the big 10 in rushing, but that was because of their first three games where they rushed for over a thousand yards. The last two, they rushed for about 230. So they're going to have to yeah. definitely yeah. up that. Yeah, no, that you're right. And, and what's interesting to me is you look at what the Wisconsin game against Notre Dame and it was the same thing. It's like, well, you know, they weren't great, but you look at the score. How could you complain? It's 41 to 13 or whatever it was. Like, how can you complain about a neutral site 41 13 win over Wisconsin? And then Notre Dame goes and plays Cincinnati the next week and is down 17 nothing at a half. Like, we, we hear Ryan Day talk all the time about the importance of balance. I don't know that there has been one game where Michigan has been balanced. And that's sort of a function of if they can run the ball, they're just going to run the ball and they're not going to bother passing it. You haven't seen like the 250 250 kind of game that that Brian Day kind of strives for, or a lot of coaches strive for. And, you know, we always hear, you know, balance is not about necessarily the same number of yards. It's about being able to do both things. I don't think we've seen a game where Michigan can do both both things, or Michigan has demonstrated they could do both things. Seeing the passing game is like, that's encouraging. Like, okay, now you've seen that. So that's, that's a good sign. They've hit some down, you know, deep balls downfield. You have seen the games where they run the ball. You haven't seen them be able to do both things at once. And, you know, again, I, for like look, looking ahead to the Penn State game, if Penn State's able to take away the, the uh, rush, rushing attack from, from uh, Michigan, is Penn State's offense going to be able to do enough to, you know, challenge Michigan? You know, can, if Penn State gets into the high 20s, is that enough? Is, are they going to be able to hold Penn State or hold Michigan's offense down to, you know, the low 20s and win the game? it seems like that's, that's one that's kind of, I mean, you got, you got at, at Nebraska, at Michigan state, at Penn state, all coming up. Those are three tough road games. You know, Ohio state's through two of their tough uh, big 10 road games. Michigan has uh, those three coming up and at Maryland is, you know, I mean, we'll see. I mean, all of, all of the things you said about Adrian Martinez, Talia Tonga Valoa is kind of the poor man's Adrian Martinez. So we'll, you know, like we'll see, but that's at least a puncher's chance kind of game. I, 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 I don't know. I don't know what to make of this team. It is just, it's like, I should be looking at this and going, yes, they have, they're, they're figuring it out. It's, they're getting better. They have the, you know, they have the pieces. Harbaugh is finally, you know, sort of taking them off the leash and not, not, you know, constantly playing, you know, two yards in a cloud of dust football. But I just, I don't know. I don't know if this is the uh, ghosts of 2018 or if uh, this is just, you know, I, I'm I'm not completely ready to buy in because it's just they haven't played a complete team yet. But they they just you know no one none of the Power Five games that they've played have have been like completely dominant games. They have not had they have not done to anyone what Ohio State did to Rutgers. And when you look at what Rutgers did to Michigan the week before that, and what Michigan tried to do to Rutgers and couldn't do to Rutgers, you compare that to Ohio State. It's just like th- that is a data point that's kind of hard to ignore right now, five and zero or not. As you're talking, I was looking up games where Michigan has rushed and passed for 200 yards against a Power 5 opponent just once in the last three seasons since 2019. That was the Minnesota game last year with the Joe Milton season opener and everything looked like it was all great. 
2020 Heisman 20, winner, Jim 2020, Yes, 2020 yeah. Heisman yeah. winner, uh, mm-hmm. September Heisman. Although that may have been an August Heisman. I, that, you know, that was that was all, October. That was an October Heisman, remember? Yes, yes, yes. October 24th. Boy, what a year last year was. Do you know, Tom, do you know how many games of 200 yards passing and 200 yards rushing Ohio State has had in that same span? Over the last three years? Against Power 5 opponents. I'm going to say... 10 14 mm. is that is that more than one it is more than one and there's a couple uh-huh. with like a 199 in there as well mm-hmm. so uh, yes 14 but before, times but before we move off of michigan's offense i do want to say I, I was impressed with blake corm he didn't he didn't do a whole heck of a lot in the run game in the Tough. past game in the past game there was a th- real deep in their end at one point it was a third and eight or something like that and there was just kind of like a swing pass and there were like two three wisconsin defenders kind of right in front of the first down line and he just he ran through a guy and got the first down. It was like you think of you think of Hassan Haskins as you know the thunder to Corum's lightning. It was like oh you, hey that, that guy just got hit by lightning and uh, didn't work out well for him. So that was I, I was I was very impressed with that. I thought that was uh, that was something new. And again, the rushing numbers weren't there, but it's just you're, you're seeing you know you he's an impressive player. Hassan Haskins is a is a good player. You you see the pieces there for Michigan. Yeah. It's just it's not coming together yet in the in the run game. I, I wrote that one down where mm-hmm. he picked up that first down. Had really no business picking it up. Mm-hmm. Then he he got hit again uh, running the ball. And he he hurt somebody, and he's just five eight, two hundred pounds, and compact. And last year he had trouble breaking tackles. This year, not so much. He's a strong dude. He's a tough runner. I it, it's that second level that you know maybe he's just not getting to right now and. They were trying to run some wide stuff as well with receivers. Wisconsin defended it really, really well, I thought, on on all of that, the the ground stuff. So kudos to them. Tom, let's move to the Michigan defense, where the defensive line pretty much controlled this game. Mm -hmm. Wisconsin, not a great offense, uh, perhaps a bad offense at this point. Perhaps. Definitely a bad offense at this point. I think the – the uh, the data and the results are in. They are a bad offense, and Michigan made them pay for that. They the most impressive thing for me, knowing that Wisconsin doesn't have the skill talent. They usually have the offensive line. Michigan's defensive line was controlling this game. David Ojabo, defensive end slash outside linebacker, pass rusher, two and a half sacks. Maybe could have you know he caused some issues. Had a forced fumble on just reaching for the quarterback uh, and knocked the ball out. This this was by far his best game, and he's starting to come into into form. Aiden Hutchinson is always just fine. Whatever you know, you just you just chalk him up for a sack and some pressures, and don't even worry about him. And Mozzie Smith, defensive tackle, had a pass breakup on a screen to Jake Ferguson in the first quarter that was probably going to be a touchdown. If you watch the replay, there's like there's like one defender between Ferguson and I don't know, like a sixty yard touchdown, and there's a blocker. That was going to run with Ferguson. So that was a big play by him. We saw Chris Hinton with a, a sack as well, just basically reaching out and barely tapping Graham Mertz and Graham Mertz collapsing like um, you know, a, a collapsible quarterback, Tom. As one does, yes. The old collapsible quarterback trick. Yes. One name you didn't mention there, Dax Hill. I mean, yes. we, we talked about him earlier, drilled, came came on a third and nine or something like that, blitz, just drilled Mertz in the ribs, knocked him out for the game. He also had a really, really athletic interception later. He's, you know, he's the guy on that defense that all year you've kind of gone like, you know, you go through the Ohio State defense, like he's the guy who's, you know, he would start somewhere for Ohio State. He, he's, you know, he continues to be impressive. They, they use him in a bunch of different ways. I, you know, this was a game over the summer that when we talked about it, it was like, you know, they always lose to Wisconsin in exactly the same way. The interior of the defensive line can't hold up and they get run over. And th- that has been the case every time they played Wisconsin in the last few years. It didn't happen on Saturday. Went back and looked. Well, guess what? Wisconsin hasn't been able to do that to anyone this year. This is this is like this is a ter- just a terrible Wisconsin offensive line. They have no right. Like Wisconsin doesn't have an offensive line. Wisconsin doesn't have running backs. Like w- what planet are we on? Uh, but you know, here's against Notre Dame: twenty-eight carries for seventy-eight yards. Uh, against uh, Michigan, 32 carries, 43 yards. That's the last two weeks. So 60 carries for 120 yards, two yards per carry, long of 10 against Notre Dame, long of 13 against Michigan. 
And then against Penn State earlier, 58 carries for 180 yards. That's uh, long of 19, one touchdown there, 3.1 yards per carry. So against the three power five teams they've played this year, 118 carries, 301 yards, one touchdown, three games for Wisconsin. It's not like they're giving up on the run. They've run it 40 times a game on average, 301 yards in three games, 2.55 yards per carry. Like this was, this was a game that before the year I would have circled on the calendar and said, if they can stop Wisconsin's run, that will really tell me that. And it just tells me you look at all the other Wisconsin results this year. It's like, Oh, that didn't tell me anything. Cause this is what everyone's doing to Wisconsin. I mean, Penn state has a good defense. Notre Dame has a pretty good defense. They're not incredible, but they have a pretty good defense. I feel like we can say Michigan has a pretty good defense, but if you told me before the year, Wisconsin's or Michigan's going to hold Wisconsin to 32 carries for 43 yards, I would have said, oh my gosh, Michigan has a world-beating defense, and I don't think you can necessarily say that yet. I probably would have said, well, I guess my expectations for Jalen Berger to finally do something you know, as a sophomore were wildly overblown, <laughs> and Ches Malusi was not who anybody thought he was, and that must be why he didn't get the ball at Clemson. Because there were, there were concerns that Wisconsin wasn't going to be able to run the ball well this year based on last year. But you just assumed, I, I certainly assumed, like, well, no, it's all going to come together because we did talk about Jalen Berger, and I have talked about him. Like, this has to be, I mean, P.J. Hill came out of freaking nowhere way back when. John, John Clay, they, you know, you you get a five five star running back and then Jonathan Taylor who from New Jersey some three star dude okay whatever and then boom he's you know just this crazy all american there's just always somebody and this is two years in a row there's been nobody and that's a shocking development and one that Wisconsin is going to have to get fixed Dax Hill then also almost knocked out uh, the uh, Chase Wolf I mean he came on mm-hmm. another blitz they're blitzing him now even more, and he's coming with a purpose. And that dude is, is really, really good. Uh, also, DJ Turner, the corner, they were rotating three corners. I thought I thought he played well. Uh, did probably get away with some PI on, on a deep pass, but bounced right back. And so they're, I, I think the fact that they've got another corner that they can play is good. Um, if Jamon Green or uh, Vincent Gray gives something up there. They can they can sit for a series and watch. Wisconsin could do nothing to take advantage of anything in the secondary. This is just all over. It's a bad offense, and Paul Chris is a really good play caller. But you know, if if you're six cards short in your game of solitaire, you can't <laughs> you can't win the game. And sometimes if you're just one card short, you think you can. You're like I, you know. I, don't worry. I, I don't need that 10 of clubs. I'll figure it out. <laughs> but when you're like, you have nothing, um, there's, there's no there there for the Wisconsin offense and Michigan took advantage of it. And that's something that I, I think that is a, a, a good sign as well, that Michigan is taking advantage of other teams weaknesses. They can exploit them and they're good enough at what they do that they don't always need to be two dimensional. And Jim Harbaugh doesn't – we complain that they weren't able to throw the ball. Mm -hmm. Now they're not able to run the ball, but they're still winning by throwing in enough. So Mm -hmm. they're doing what they need to, but that's that's okay for Wisconsin. That's okay. Maybe it's okay for Nebraska. Certainly okay for Northwestern. But Michigan Monday is about how the Wolverines and Ohio State, how the, the, the things build and how they match up against each other. And the way things are going right now with a two-dimensional Ohio State, Ohio State, a defense that is coming together, an offense that is, uh, if this is who C.J. Stroud is, and this is who C.J. Stroud has been in practice to win the job, and this is what Michigan is, I'm, I'm feeling a whole lot better about Ohio State's chances now than when we were talking about Ohio State going into Ann Arbor on, say, September 9th or whatever, mm-hmm. and it not being a good matchup for Ohio State. This matchup, I think, is getting better and better for the Buckeyes. It is because Michigan is getting better. Michigan's not there yet on, on either side of the ball. They're getting better. I mean, like you said, they, they've, they have shown they can do each individual piece of the game. They have not shown that they can do it against a great defense. They've not shown, you know, that they have not shown that. Um, they have not shown that they're going to lock down a good offense, but you go back to last year, 
They got gashed by some bad offenses last year. They got ripped to shreds by Michigan State. Well, now you're playing a bad offense and you're not getting ripped to shreds. So that's progress. It doesn't tell me that you're going to stop a good offense, but it tells me, okay, this is progress. You're stopping bad offenses now. This is what you're supposed to do if you're a pretty good defense. It feels like this is a pretty good defense. It feels like this is a good, good ish work, work in progress offense. They're getting there. The offense would looked a lot more. I mean, the look offense looked a lot more impressive when they were just able to run the ball and run the ball and run the ball and no one could stop them. No one had any answers. And it was like, well, maybe they're just not passing the ball because they don't have to pass the ball. Like, well, now they have to pass the ball and it's like, it's okay. It's not explosive. It's not, you know, you hit a couple big plays, but it's not consistently explosive. It's not, they don't have a lot of wide receivers. You get the ball four yards downfield and you're like, this might go 70 yards. You know, they don't have a Garrett Wilson. They don't have a Chris Olave. They don't have Travion Henderson out of the backfield. They don't have those kinds of guys, which is, I mean, not a surprise. We've talked about this all year. This is a team that is coming together pretty well. And it looks like they're kind of maximizing what they can be with what they have. But I don't know that that's necessarily going to be enough to win at Penn State. I don't know if that's necessarily going to be enough to win against Ohio State. Yeah, even that Michigan State game, like we, we could be three weeks away from that Michigan State game being seven and zero Michigan versus seven and zero Michigan State. Like if you look at the schedules, like that that is a distinct possibility. And you know what'll be interesting to me is if this is a much better, far improved Michigan team, but they lose at Michigan State, they lose at Penn State, and then they lose to Ohio State, not particularly close you lose to ohio state 45 to 27 something like that what's the mindset in michigan at that point because they're nine and three there have been clear signs of progress but also you're still a long way away and now next year coming to columbus and cj stroud's back and you've got to have a first time starting quarterback i mean it's like i don't know what the mindset is at that point because it's that is sort of what this is shaping up to be now that's that's better than we were expecting at the beginning of the year we were talking about, you know, seven and five Michigan, maybe eight and four Michigan. This is more like a nine and three, 10 and two team to me now. But it seems like this is there's there's still stuff that's going to catch up with them at some point. Yeah. And we now know for sure that the first three games, that running game was that was not the real Michigan running game. I I don't know that this is all it, the last two is is the real Michigan running game either because they played two good run defenses. Mm hmm. I think maybe they what they need to do is get back into rushing for at least 200 yards a game and controlling the ball that way. That way, when you do get into a game against a good opponent, there's this um, you're able to do it. Like you, you can control the ball, you can get those first downs, you can keep the ball away from offenses that can attack your defense in different ways. And and then again, of course, if you can't run the ball as we're seeing. You become one dimensional and Wisconsin is going to beat the crap out of you, mm -hmm. but not this year. I mean, it's mm -hmm. uh, the way they the way Michigan is doing it has been intriguing, has been odd, but they're suffocating people and it's, they are making plays defensively. It's not just chase chase Wolf, just throwing it willy nilly. Like I thought maybe Graham Mertz would, Graham Mertz would, because I came into this game saying if, uh, Graham Mertz doesn't lose it, then I think Wisconsin has a pretty good chance. But he played he played well enough until he got hurt, and then Chase Wolf throws an interception. Daxton Hill makes a good catch on that one. That was, I believe, one play after he fumbled on a sack. So it's Michigan's defense making plays, and and their special teams recovering a fumble and getting everything out of everybody when one part isn't playing well they've got a couple of others the the defense and the special teams or the offense and the special teams they complement each other very well the scheme is looking good defensively the players are comfortable in it you can tell there's there i don't think there's been really any confusion we saw confusion from ohio state's defense this season i don't think we've seen that yet from michigan's defense and of course it will take an offense to do that but overall overall just a um, a dominating performance score wise, but this is not a finished Michigan product yet. And I don't think uh, it shouldn't be, they should continue to get better. I don't know that. I don't know that they are though. They're it, until I see the, the running game tick back up. I, I, I need to see the running game improve for me to think the offense is getting better. Yeah. I mean, they're, they're getting better overall, but they're getting, 
you know, they're getting marginally better. Like Ohio, you look at Ohio state and Ohio state is night and day, a different team than it was at the beginning of the season. Michigan's like, yeah, I mean, they're better in some areas than they were at the beginning of the season, but with as many young guys as Ohio state is playing, I mean, like true freshmen that they're relying on, those are guys who are going to have, you know, if you don't hit the freshman wall, those are guys who are, you know, light years better by the end of the year than they were at the beginning of the year. I'll be interested to see this weekend what the offense does against Nebraska because Nebraska's offense is kind of like a question mark to me where, yeah, they put up 56 points against Northwestern, but they put up 20 in overtime against Michigan state and 16 against Oklahoma and 28 against Buffalo and 22 in a season opener against Illinois. But they also, they've given up 30 points in that season opener to Illinois, which at this point I'm almost kind of tossing out. It just, you know, that seems like the real outlier in their season. Seven points to Fordham, three points to Buffalo, 23 points at Oklahoma. That one still is impressive to me. 23 points in overtime at Michigan State, seven points to Northwestern. Like, if Michigan puts up 40 points this week in, in Nebraska, it's like almost no matter how it happens, unless it's like a real, you know, Notre Dame, Wisconsin, like, you know, it's a 13 points after the third quarter and then it's just a bunch of pick sixes or something. If they if the offense is putting up 38, 42 points this weekend against Nebraska, I'll I'll be a, be a believer at that point. I still don't know what to expect out of Nebraska's offense. It's just it's like you know they're they're okay, they're fine. If they run, I mean you you, you pulled up the stats earlier for the uh, what they did against Northwestern last week on the ground was fifty something rushes for four hundred something yards. Mm-hmm. I mean they're not doing that against Michigan. But are they are they running for five yards of carry against Michigan or are they running for three yards of carry against Michigan? That I feel like that's going to tell us something is Adrian Martinez. You know, if they're running for five yards of carry, that sets up Adrian Martinez to have the 11 for 17, but for 200 yards because you're throwing off of, you know, they have to sell out to stop the run and you're throwing over that. Can can Nebraska run for five yards of carry this weekend? I, I'm going to be interested to see that. You know, the, the, yeah, how much how much is Nebraska able to run the ball against Michigan? And, you know, can the Michigan offense get into the upper 30s against Nebraska's defense? If you see those two things, like it's still Nebraska, but I think at that point, it's like, okay, I I will be more bought in on Michigan at that point. I I think maybe they, what I'm, what I'm wanting to see is, will they attack Adrian Martinez to try to cause issues knowing that that leaves them vulnerable or will they just sit back and wait for him to throw them the ball or fumble the ball and see if Aiden Hutchinson and David Ojabo can just sack him and knock the ball away because he's not opposed to doing that either. And so it's how they're going to attack him. That'll be interesting to watch. Pretty fascinating game. Probably will end up with the same score. We'll be saying the same thing next week. Like, I don't know how this happened this way because there's nothing super that Michigan did, but they won another game by four touchdowns and here we are. But, but just hold on because, you know, uh, if they can do that against bye week, then then we're talking but yeah so they have nebraska next week then then they rest they have a bye week then it's northwestern at home at michigan state indiana at home at penn state at maryland at ohio state so after ne- nebraska they'll be able to take a look as ryan day says come up for air and see where everything is and, and how they got there and a sticks in no michigan just like i predicted perhaps next week yeah, it's it's real intriguing to me that that this is a team that you're you're seeing the results, but what you're seeing on the field doesn't necessarily match the results. I just I want I want to see a game where it looks like oh you know they're, they're not going to do to Nebraska what Ohio State did to Rutgers, but you mm-hmm. you want to see a game like Ohio State was winning games earlier in the year, and it's like but it doesn't look like it should. The Rutgers game was the first time that it was like this is what a superior team absolutely just stomping on an inferior team looks like I, I kind of want to see that from Michigan before I'm willing to kind of put them in that class right now. They're, I, I, they're in there with Penn state. They're in there with, you know, we're gonna put, I mean, sir, I was, I was maybe, I maybe have Iowa ahead of Michigan right now. I mean, what, what's the line if Michigan goes to Iowa this weekend? I mean, is Iowa favored by six? I mean, it feels like Iowa's a better team than Michigan is right now. It, you know, Michigan's in that second tier there of the Big Ten below the Ohio State and Iowa so far this year. They're in there with Penn State. And, and you know, you want to throw Michigan State in there. I'm not necessarily going to fight you on it. But I, I just I want to see a performance that looks like the final score, because until you do, you still have games. It still feels a little fluky and unsustainable to me at times. 
Well, and the very fact that we're talking about Penn State as in this lower tier, it says a lot about how Penn State has been winning as well. It's similar mm-hmm. to Michigan at points where mm-hmm. it's like how, you know, it's just kind of ugly. You know, the 28-20 win over Auburn, 24 nothing over Indiana, it's impressive-ish. But there's been, a, it's never been pretty. The 16-10 win over Wisconsin could have gone either way. And so now they're the what, like the number four team in the country. But I don't know that anybody really thinks they're the number four team in the country. But if you can get them while when they are, and then they keep winning after that, then uh, it, it'll look good for whichever team that is. Uh, so perhaps even Ohio State. Tom, anything else before we get out of here on the Michigan Wolverines? No, nope, just I was I was just pulling up uh, tickets at Nebraska this weekend just to see sort of get a judge judgment for you know how what the level of excitement is, is in Nebraska. Like 150 bucks will get you in, kind of on the you know 20 yard line, uh, 45 rows up. So, you know, if you want to sit in better seats, it's 250 bucks and kind of closer to the 50. So, uh, you know, this is this is very clearly not a Nebraska fan base that's like all in with both feet, but it feels like they that that is a Nebraska team that is better than its record indicates. Like they almost beat Michigan State. They should have beaten Illinois, and if they played Illinois now, I think they beat Illinois comfortably. They came. They, they gave Oklahoma a pretty good game. I mean, that's that is a uh, what two and three or three and three team that that feels like it could be five and one right now without changing too much. And if you are a Michigan fan listening to this and you're thinking, "Boy, I wonder if I should go to the Nebraska game," the answer is emphatically yes. You should go. Mm-hmm. Tickets aren't super outrageous. They're basically face value for an Ohio State game. So go experience. Get there early. Enjoy it. The Nebraska crowd is great. The atmosphere is awesome. Campus is fine. Around the uh, the energy around the stadium for a game is, I think it's it's our favorite place to be, other than of course Michigan Stadium. Mm-hmm. But yes, if you if you're on the fence, go. Thank me later. Thank Tom later. Thank us in writing. Thank us in uh, you know however you want to thank us, but just go, enjoy it, experience it, and then you'll probably go again when you play Nebraska on the road, I don't know, in 2027. Who knows anymore with all of these games? Well, it's a fun trip. They have, uh, it's a great campus. It's a great city. The fans are great. It's a fun stadium. They have some cool traditions. They have a nice museum in one of the end zones. They have all sort, you know, all their old Heismans and all that kind of stuff. You can even see the 1997 National Championship Trophy, which would be, I'm sure, quite a thrill for Michigan fans. That's awesome. That way, it's an opportunity for Michigan fans to see who won the 1997 National Championship right there a trophy that you can stare at right there in your personage and because you can't do that at home. So you've got to go somewhere to see it. So I apologize. We, we had them, we were being real nice. And then Tom had to go that way. And that's now what this show is about. So that will do it though. Want to thank you all for tuning in. Uh, As always, you can find us at BuckeyeScoop.com. Feel free to become a member. If you're, if you're not become one, if you are, thank you for that. And also you can find all of our podcasts from BuckeyeScoop.com. At youtube.com slash Buckeye Scoop, we drop them all the time. Uh, live interviews, streams, uh, highlights from high school games, all sorts of stuff there. And if you're into any of that, go ahead and, and subscribe, and you'll be notified whenever we drop something new. So thank you all, and we will talk to you later.